Welcome to Mind Your Business. This is lesson in crisis. Moving forward. Over the years, the Baltimore Times and PNC Bank partnered on producing Mind Your Business, a small business event with packed information to help small businesses not only grow, but prosper. We've had many experts giving their expert advice. We met for lunch and chatted and exchanged ideas and business cards. This year, COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on our plans, not, but not our ideas. And we're meeting under different circumstances and sharing the information in a different way. Today, we are looking at the effect of COVID-19, discussing its effects, but not defeat. We are instead showing the overcoming spirit, getting your businesses the right tools, showing how businesses can pivot to success and how small businesses with the right tools can grow into big businesses. We want to thank PNC for sponsoring this series. They have always been an invaluable partner. Thank you, PNC. Well, Hello. good afternoon, good everyone. Afternoon. This is Paul Taylor, and I'm uh, going to be a moderator for this event. Um, I would, I am with the Mayor's Office of Small and Minority Business, and I provide technical assistance to small businesses. Also, advocate for small businesses in Baltimore. I'm so happy that Joy has asked me to moderate this panel. This is an esteemed panel with a lot of very, very. Um, informative information that you'll get from from some of these experts in in their different fields and also businesses that have pivoted and have done some things that i think that you will be glad to hear about today so thank you all very much for attending and um uh and thank you all very much for attending and we're very happy happy to have you here i'm gonna just start off by introducing all of the speakers they're gonna briefly tell you who they are and what their business is all about. And then we will start with some questions that will help sort of stimulate where we are. So first I'd like to introduce Ms. Stephanie Geller. Stephanie is gonna give you a little a rundown on who she is. Stephanie. Thank you, Paul. I am Stephanie Geller. I actually run a nonprofit initiative called Thank Community you, Wealth Builders. And our focus is on helping to nurture more sustainable, equitable um, neighborhoods across Baltimore by tapping community wealth building approaches. I'm here today though to talk about our newest program which is called the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange. And we are working to grow the field of grassroots investment crowdfunding across Baltimore. And this is a method that businesses can use to raise capital directly from their customers and community. And what we specifically like about this approach is that it not only enables businesses to get the capital they need, but it also builds individual wealth as residents actually invest in businesses and community wealth and ideally helps to foster a much more sustainable, resilient um, economy. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, now we're going to go uh, next to, to Adam, who uh, is an attorney who has come in to talk to us. A Adam, please. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the Baltimore Times and PNC for having me today. My name is Adam Holop Center. I am an attorney as well as the executive director of Maryland Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. We are also a nonprofit organization. And although our focus is providing access to legal services and education for artists, we talk about arts with a cap with a in a very big tent kind of way. So whether you're a culinary artist or a maker or a painter or a filmmaker or a performance artist, really most small businesses happen to have some creative aspect to them. We see ourselves as being a nonprofit that uh, works in this specific area of small business needs. So this means if folks are looking to have assistance registering their business entities like LLCs or review contracts or register their intellectual property like copyright, trademark, deal with commercial property issues in terms of leases, um, we're really the nonprofit organization that provides access uh, to those small business legal services for creatives of all types 
uh, throughout the state of Maryland. We are based in Baltimore and the majority of the work that we do is in the Baltimore region. Um, so we pride ourselves on doing that. And really, you know, what we'll talk about a little bit later is, you know, all of our creatives, uh, their small businesses have been so affected by this current moment. Um, and so we have uh, really had to help support a lot of folks um, who've had to pivot their business or respond to crises uh, related to, to everything going on right now. Um, so that's who we are. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you. And next we'll have, um, so one, one of my favorite companies, we've got two representatives from that company. Um, I don't know how you're going to split up what, what roles you're going to talk about, but Stephen, I'll start with you because you got the hat on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul and PNC um, and, and Baltimore Times for the opportunity. I'm Stephen White, creative director and co-founder for Different Regards. We located in the community of Mount Vernon in Baltimore City. My primary role is to design, educate, mentor, and bring brand awareness to the company. Since 2011, when Different Regard was established, Different Regard designs and manufactures wardrobes with sustainable clothing for your personal, your professional, and your social lifestyle. We are a zero waste company. We also offer made to measure and ready to wear clothing also at our retail showroom on Charles Street. We have our second um, operating location, which is our manufacturing space, is located at 841 North Howard Street. Thank you so much. Stephen, you might want to just talk a little bit about um, the company and what your role is in there also. I mean, Dominic, I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you for having me this morning. So I'm Dominic Davis. I am the art director and founder of Different Regard. Uh, Stephen pretty much said it best, you know, we design and manufacture sustainable men and women apparel in Mount Vernon, Baltimore. Um, my job is to oversee the artistic vision for the company, is, uh, make sure that we're executing our mission and our vision for the company. Thank you so much. All right. So we've got Everett here. Everett, you're, I, don't, I don't know what part of the world you're in, but uh, we, I'm glad to have you here on the screen. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, and also, as, as the other uh, members said, thank you to the Baltimore Times and PNC Bank for the opportunity. I'm the CEO of Lendistry. Lendistry is a fintech community development financial institution. We try to, to help make the borrowers process seamless, efficient, and scalable. Really, really focus on underserved small business owners. Um, and that uh, our work has led us to do a couple of different things. The first thing is to go out and get certifications then make it uh, make it easier for us to do uh, lending to underserved communities. So, so we're a CDFI, or a member of Federal Home Loan Bank. Uh, we're also an SBA lender. We also have been extremely focused during this COVID environment to help small businesses. We've been doing PPP loans, originating PPP loans, originating grant programs. So far, we've originated roughly about $374 million in capital uh, deployed. We've helped about 13,500 businesses and then one of the other things that we offer is online technical assistance for small businesses to be able to take classes as they think about pivoting and as they think about uh, improving their business models. Uh, we've offered about 4,000 small businesses classes uh, during the last uh, four months. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to the conversation. All right, and bringing up the rear is Mr. David Bramble in relationship to Ms. Joy Bramble, but we'll just talk about David Bramble because David <laughs> has a very interesting company. You, you may have may be wondering why all these people seem sort of different and why what is the theme of this, but you'll get it soon. So David, go ahead. So uh, uh, my name is uh, Dave Bramble. I'm the managing partner of MCB Real Estate. Uh, we're a commercial real estate developer uh, based here in Baltimore. Um, you know, just a quick background on us. Uh, we invest and develop industrial retail office and mixed use assets. We own and operate about 9 million feet, um, manage over a billion dollars of real estate. Um, and the reason that I'm interested in small businesses, despite the fact that I've got lots of big national tenants, what really drives our business is our relationship with the small tenants who, who use space with us. We call them, you know, users or tenants. So I'm excited to be here today to talk about, uh, you know, how, how how the landlord relationship can be an important part of the growth growth relationship for uh, for, uh, for for small businesses. All right. So one of the, the common themes that tie all of us together, and I love these pictures of David's projects around the country, but 
one of the things that tie all of this together is that during this um, this period with COVID, we've all had to make some adjustments to our businesses. Some of them are adjustments that um, have changed our business model. Some of them have accelerated the work that we've been doing. Some of them um, have redefined the relationships that one that a lot of these folk have with their some of their tenants and so forth. So we're going to get into that, and this common theme will be sort of resilience and pivoting. Um, I wanted to uh, have Dominic, who is a small business right here in Baltimore, as they said, they're a manufacturer, they're a clothing manufacturer. They've had to make a pivot. And I, I want you to, to give us a little sense of how that worked, because it's a very important uh, uh, aspect of what we're talking about today. Dominic? <clears throat> Yes. So uh, prior to COVID, uh, different regard, we have two op operating locations. One, our retail store decreased our sales by like 90 percent back in early March. So um, our team and I, we figured we had to do something, you know, and we collectively came together and we started, you know, uh, figuring out how could we took a, about a week or two weeks for research and development. And that um, led us to manufacturing the medical grade PPE that was needed, you know, both masks and gowns, you know, um, just here in our, in our local community. And we also were able to fulfill orders abroad. Um, so that pivot experience looked like seven days a week, um, 12, 15, 16 hour days of operating um, to make sure that we can get the necessary, because we had to build, we hired seven to eight more additional employees. We had to get about 60% more equipment than we would typically have in our space um, just to actually get up to speed. Wow. So it sounds like, um, uh, Stephen and, and, and Dominic, it sounds like during PPP, you actually had to expand your business because you've had to um, bring up new, new um, residents in and, and expand your operation. Is that is that sort of true, um, Stephen? You're muted. <clears throat> I realize that now. Okay. We pretty much had to expand our manufacturing team tremendously because we were only producing small runs of clothing locally. All of our product was made in Baltimore. We were pretty much just producing clothing. So when COVID hit, we had to ramp up the team to actually go into manufacturing mode. Manufacturing mode meant more people, more sores. Um, we needed a quality control team. We need actual teams, packing team. You know, it was just like all hands on deck. Our company grew faster than what we could even imagine on the manufacturing side. However, on the retail side, we were completely wiped out pretty much. So, so your 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 so how did you know, and how do you did it, you identify a client? Because um, you had to have a client for you to have expanded. You had to have a client who's going to need your product. Steve. Yes. Yes. So what we did was we reached out to other makers who are in our similar field and we asked them, what were they doing about the COVID crisis? You know, what, what, what was their plan? What would that look like? Um, what was their next step doing in the midst of COVID? So we pretty much utilized our made in Baltimore community. We utilized the other, um, of course, um, your office, Paul, we utilize you guys as well. I mean, we just utilize all resources, um, our local government definitely heavily, and we just sent emails out, and this was just on a consistent basis until we reached someone who was able to assist us. The first person who we reached out to actually was Ella Priska. Um, she's um, she gave us our first good run of PPE. Um, her and a local doctor, um, and then from there we moved into. Um, oh my God, everything happened so fast. What was next, Dominic? Who was next? I can't. Okay. Fire department. department. Fire department, yes. Yeah. Um, Fire department, the funeral homes, dental offices. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been yeah. an accelerator. And then just other companies that are needing a PPE, just gyms and different, there's just so many different companies, just local companies that we were able, I mean, obviously we all need to have masks, you know, and it was mandated by the CDC and our yeah. um, local government. Uh, so we were just there to um, serve our community. So I think another thing, what we definitely did, what we definitely took advantage of, since we were a fashion, since we are a fashion company, I decided, and Dominic and myself, we decided to make the PPE more fashionable. 
So we started to do our own designer masks and um, actually pair them with garments to show people the fashion behind PPE. And oh, now I know where all those fancy uh, masks are coming from. <laughs> um, so, so every and just, and just so you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I just wanted to put out that the. I, I want to say one thing. I'm sorry if I interrupt you. No, go I want to say um, those fashionable masks that Stephen are talking about. Back in early uh, December, last December, we've had like maybe like three bags of like uh, fabric, so we consolidate them all, make sure because we like zero waste. And all of the fabric that we're able to make all the uh, fashionable masks out of today has come from, I would guess, remnant scrap fabrics um, that we're essentially just going to. We had to repurpose them and we figured out what, what's the best way to use it during a pandemic. And we didn't know about this, but we said we're going to save it. And then this is what happened. So uh, right. we were, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. So, Everett, you, um, you you sit in a very interesting position because you've actually had to help finance some of these companies as they started thinking about PPE. And, and in particular, I want you to talk a little bit about why it was important that um, that you were a lender that came into the market at the time that you came in and, and partly because you didn't necessarily have a, a retail bank where you had customers but you you um entered the market in a very interesting time so talk a little bit about what you've been doing yeah at, at lendistry we're always looking to be in high areas of underserved communities and underserved from our standpoint would be we don't see mainstream banking going on from a lending perspective. We also look for cities, uh, counties and states where there's um, uh, what we will call, I guess, a minority majority population. I just call it a, a lot of black businesses. Um, and so we try to focus on that. And what we saw what was happening in Baltimore or what we predicted what would happen in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and a couple other cities, when some of the major banking institutions said that they were only going to allow their customers uh, to receive the PPP loan, um, we saw an opportunity where we needed to go into some of these cities a little bit heavier and a little bit deeper. And so in Baltimore, um, similar to the story that Dominic and, and Stephen told, we reached out to you and reached out to um, uh, Will and, and the people over at BDC and, and several others. And we said, okay, we need to come in here in, in, a, in a high quality way. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to have partners like Goldman Sachs um, who were able to support us. And so we just, we leveraged our technology. We leveraged the people that we knew. Um, and we just started to dig in and see how we could help the small businesses out. And that was a combination again of educating uh, the small businesses on, on how to get through the PPP process, and then also on um, how to actually get the loans and get the money that they need. And then we started to meet companies like Dominic, and he would say PPE, and I'd be saying PPP, and then I didn't, I didn't even know what PPE was until you know I started to come across small businesses like Dominic that were um, uh, like differentiated, that were that were pivoting, right? Mm -hmm. And and so then we had the other side of the house, which is okay, how do we help support some of these small businesses? whether it be lines of credit or other access to capital. And as you can imagine, we started getting these calls across the country uh, because, you know, a lot of business owners start to shift pretty quickly. And I think their story is, you know, is a similar story. I think when I heard Dominic, I think we were on a call with the city of Baltimore that later on that day, somebody from Miami called me and said, Hey, we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, what can you do for us? And, and it was someone. It was somebody we had just financed for the Super Bowl, which is the only uh, black small business that was a, a vendor for for the NFL. Um, so you'd be surprised how these things started to kind of culminate and and um, and kind of evolve, so to speak. And so Lindstrom always tries to play a role when we see these types of things happening, and where we see we can jump in and we can add a um, capital to the situation or add a difference. Mm -hmm. That's 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 critical. Um, and your role in this was very critical. Um, because while a number of the other lending institutions um, um, wanted to wanted to expand their reach to other businesses in the community, because of uh, because of regulatory issues, they were they were incapable of doing that. And so your role was vital in terms of providing funding for for small businesses that were um, not necessarily with some of our larger banks. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think it's that and it's also some that didn't even understand 
how to get to their institutions. There were several people that we, several businesses that we helped to actually get to their financial institution. You know, just sometimes when you go into a moment like a pandemic, which none of us have obviously been through before, there's a sense of panic that occurs. And so even some of the businesses that were ready and that had the paperwork, they just didn't know what, you know, what the paperwork was or, or where do I get it from? So, for example, we would say something to them like, hey, you, you need to go get your 941s or 940. You know, they think we're calling football plays. They have no idea what we're talking about. And, you know, we're trying to guide them like, no, this, this is a document that you're filing every quarter. Right. You got to go to ET or, or one of the other service providers that might be doing this for you. Um, or we had to teach them you know, so in some cases, how to do it and how to do it correctly and efficiently. Right. Right. So, David, you have the um, you have the task now of having to look at your tenants. And as a landlord, you're in the same boat because you need them to pay rent. They have the, the, the no ability to pay rent. And so they're challenged by the circumstance um, that we all are, are facing right now. How uh, t- tell us a little bit about how that works and 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 what some of the things that you've been able to negotiate with some of your tenants? Sure. I mean, I think that um, when it all started, everyone was in a complete pan uh, complete, complete panic about how this was going to come together. I think that the uh, particularly for our retail tenants, which is a lot of uh, a mix of you know small shops and you know, in addition to sort of the national tenants, also the mom and pop tenants who, who are running small businesses in these shopping centers. Um, and I think we were all really, really scared about what's going to happen. Are these guys going to be able to stay in business? What's the future of these businesses? What's the future of the landlord tenant relationship? What we found though, is that, you know, you know, we have, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tenants. Um, and the attitude that we took as a company is that, they're really our partners, um, and um, the 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 reality is is that we need them to pay rent, and they need us to to so that they can stay open and operate a business to 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 get revenue. So we sort of instead of thinking of it in an adversarial way, in other words, how much rent can I get out of you before you go out of business? We started thinking about how we can help these tenants stay in business, how we can help them make it through, which you know I think is a was a temporary event, the pandemic. Um, and now what we've seen is uh, that our tenants are bouncing back, um, that they are, uh, there was pent up retail demand during the lockdown process that we had here in the state of Maryland that we had sort of up and down the East Coast. Um, and now that uh, things are opening up again, these tenants are coming back. And what's amazing is our relationships are even stronger because they, they knew that uh, we were out to help them, not to hurt them or try to uh, try to put them in a bad position, but for us to work together to see how we can how we could navigate some really rough and uncharted waters together. I think the scary part is what's what does the future hold? Um, because for a lot of small businesses, it's not clear that they will survive um, the, the, the sort of post pandemic operating um story you know do you have a business model that's resilient um you know can you can you pivot are you in a place where uh you know you're prepared to take the next step and trust me as go as we go forward landlords will be evaluating that um to try to understand who they're doing business with uh because the landlord tenant relationship is a long-term relationship it's not a it's not a single transaction or a or a day or a week, it's years and sometimes decades, depending on the, the location and the use. So um, uh, that's sort of, we see this sort of the next evolution of, of, of how we'll be working with our small business tenants. You're on mute, Paul. Adam, as uh, some of the uh, businesses that that David just talked about who've had to change their relationships. Some of them may even have to renegotiate their leases. Some of them may have to renegotiate um, their business model and they are looking for technical assistance and looking for legal assistance to help. And what are some of the things that you've seen as you've looked at how they've had to transition? Paul, thank you for that. So um, I thought it was going to come to me next when we started talking yeah. about uh, commercial leases and, and trouble. <laughs> we 
We, as everybody knows here, I mean, there is both on the residential and also certainly uh, less identified, especially when it comes to any type of assistance from any type of governmental or other type of institution. There's a commercial eviction crisis um, that is pending. I mean, you know, one thing I'm curious about, one, David, I applaud you for working with your tenants. We've not necessarily seen that from all, all the um, landlords and property owners for uh, the clients who've been coming through our door. Um, and again, for everyone on the video here uh, who knows, you know, the, the terms of a commercial lease are far more draconian and essentially have no protections as opposed to the residential lease context. Um, therefore, you know, we've been seeing uh, very difficult situations where while there are moratoriums or ostensible moratoriums on evictions happening, as, as soon as legally and administratively we're in a place where those can start to be effectuated again it's just going to be a deluge of of folks being put out and one of the reasons is is we have a difficult scenario where again as david was explaining for most landlords and property owners their hands are tied because of the financial responsibilities that they have um to their lenders right and depending on where they sit in terms of the financial services continuum um, they sort of can pass the buck further that way. When it comes to renegotiating these things, again, generally, they're, you know, the, the tenant has no rights to do so. It really depends on what kind of potential specific leverage that they might have given the space they're in, um, the relationship that they have uh, with, with their landlord. Um, but otherwise, it's very difficult. And that one of the things that we've been seeing as well is how are people going to ever make back the money that they haven't been able to make for the past eight or nine months, right? Are they going to be put in a potential position where um, is there actual rent abatement being offered by their landlord or are they just having some type of deferred payments, right? Or forbearance um, on the payments that they have. So they're going to have a balloon payment coming up down the road because there's no way to make up nine months of, you know, no business. It's very fact specific too. Our clients are all over the place. I think as David mentioned, you know, retail is one thing, you know, we're dealing with a lot of folks who um, participate in, you know, in-person experiences and whether that's a culinary artist or a performance artist, um, their ability to pivot is, is limited and, you know, the, the cost keeps coming. We've also seen just with a lot of uh, small businesses who, you know, nonprofits and other types of associations um, who aren't using their space and therefore they're in a position where, you know, if you're in that kind of white collar position that you can have your business and the services that you provide be entirely online, um, then you're trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what way can we potentially terminate our lease if we don't need to be in our space? So it's uh, that's one place where we really need government and other institutional support um, to, to try and create some incentives uh, for landlords, property owners, and, and financial institutions to actually give folks folks a break, because otherwise we just really haven't haven't been seeing it. We've just seen sort of this purgatory um, until eviction the eviction process can really start to get going again. Okay, Ho hopefully that's not what happens, David. I I just it, it had me think about something on on your side um, because. COVID has shown us in, in many instances where you have these office spaces uh, in these really nice places in downtown Baltimore, we have nice office spaces and then the market looks like there may not, people have now recognized that, do we really need that much office space? Can people work from home? Um, and it may change how um, real estate is looked at in the future. Are you sort of planning, looking, sort of uh, strategically looking at th that that eventual occurrence where people may not need um, the space that they currently have and what would happen if that happens? Well, since I have three small kids, going to the office is like going for vacation. <laughs> but, um, I will tell you that I, I think the jury is out on, um, the jury is out on this whole idea of people never coming back to the office. I mean, we've been through waves of sort of people um, you know, going remote and then coming back and then going remote and then coming back. I think what's different this time is the technology. The technology for remote collaboration, like what we're doing right now, um, is so much better than it has been in any one of the previous sort of waves that moved against people coming back to the office. 
um, that, you know, a lot of us who own office are absolutely concerned um, that the long term demand for office will be diminished. I mean, technology changes everything. It's like it's changing everybody's businesses. This is an instance where it could impact the real estate. But I do believe in the long run that there is no substitute um, for in person um, meetings, communication, and collaboration. And the place to do that is the office. The question is, is how much of it do you need? Um, and how is that going to impact the amount of space that people take? I can tell you what's happening right now um, is that what people are shying away from is any long term commitment to office. We are seeing a lot of short term renewals at our build at our businesses, at our, our at our buildings. Um, and then um, on projects where we are looking for long term commitments to get started with a large construction project. Um, we're finding that all of those folks who were previously focused on that are saying, you know what, let me do a short term renewal and see what happens over the next, you know, 24 months, 12, 24 months as we figure out what's going on with uh, the COVID environment. And Paul, yeah. I would just like to add, you know, the, the flip side of the coin that we've seen a lot uh, in, in terms of this situation as well is thinking about premises liability for commercial spaces. So a lot of clients with whom we work, um, you know, generally they might be used to having members of the public come into their commercial space and the sort of rights and responsibilities, obligations that they had um, to, to abide by in terms of creating a, a safe and uh, welcoming environment. But now the responsibilities are as, as intense as they are unclear, um, right? We have different guidances that are sort of coming from city, state and federal um, at different times and trying to help folks who really haven't thought about the sort of tort responsibility or premises liability um, that they need to abide by is something that adds enhanced cost, enhanced administrative um, needs. And for certain businesses, um, that's also a big part of their calculus in terms of how they're going to engage with their commercial space. That's great. Um, uh, Everett, um, uh, one of the things that I was, uh, thinking about as, as businesses, um, this, this, so COVID has actually caused businesses to do what I would call a reset, right? Or a stress test that, that's similar to what banks have, had did in the, when the, the, the crisis happened in 2008. Um, that stress test told you that, they were, that some banks were going to survive and some banks were not going to survive. And what would that look like? In this case, the stress test is now on the businesses. The businesses are now being stressed to see what you know where their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, just based on the fact that you've seen so many different types of businesses, you've funded so many different types of business. What are some of the challenges that you saw businesses come to you with that um, caused them not to be able to to get a loan or not be able to um, where you think they may not have may not survive this this stress test. Yeah, Paul, it's a great question. I think one of the first things we look at is the leadership and what has the leadership been through um, in terms of the history of either the organization or the history of their professional career. And so the history of organization, we look at time and business. So if they were around pre-2008, as you just mentioned, or during 2008, we get a sense that they've been through a crisis before and they may know how to manage through it. And so we might ask questions like, how did you manage through it? If they haven't been through a crisis, we might ask, okay, well, what types of things have you done to prepare yourself for this? And we know it's not going to be perfect, but I'll give you an example of where Dominic and I met. We met initially through mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, which, by the way, has a class tomorrow, which I can throw the link in the comment box just so everybody has it if they want to go to a free session and just see what that's about. But I didn't have to meet Dominic to know that he had been sitting in a class, one, because mm -hmm. I've helped to teach some of those classes and been a panel, but I knew what he as a business owner had been through and why he might have never went into the back of the factory and pulled old fabric and old material out. He might have never called you or called the fireman or any of that. I know that he went through a simulated scenario where someone just asked him a simple question. What would you do if all hell broke loose? Um, and so that's really important for us to, to know that either someone on the board, someone in the leadership, the organization itself has been through troubled times. That's number one. Number two, we just started asking basic questions. What is your game plan? 
and and you have to understand from a lender standpoint, I don't care really if you have to get three jobs to pay me back. Now, I might not force you to get the three jobs, but I am looking for the entrepreneur that says, I will roll up my sleeves and I'll do everything I possibly can to pay you back and to keep this business going. That's the answer that we want to hear. And that's what we're looking for, because it's a pandemic today. It's a death in the family tomorrow. It's an employee who leave a top employee who leaves you the next week. It's your supplier going out of business or your manufacturer going out of business. It's you got a big contract from the state of Maryland. No matter what it is, businesses go through cycles. And so what we're looking for is that business owner that understands how to pivot in those cycles. And to be clear, there's good cycles and there's bad cycles. Right. Um, and, and equally, uh, both of them can be dangerous to a business. If you went from, you know, 100 customers to 500 customers, you got almost as many problems as you do going through a pandemic and going from 100 customers to zero. It's a different way you handle it, of course. But again, we're looking for that fortitude in the business owner and the leadership and the management first. And then we start looking at other things because because capital can solve a lot of things. But what capital can't solve is leadership and culture. Mm -hmm. That's that's critically important. Um, typically, when um, when banks are underwriting and, uh, businesses, they look at the leadership. They also look at the environment. And right now, the environment is at, a, at zero because everybody's facing the same thing. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to pivot this question to you because as um, as you think about wealth building and and, and trying to help create f uh, financial models that can help business, how how is your program uh, going to support business growth um, going into the future? Right, so our approach is actually quite different from what we just heard, and it's sort of based on the the model of connecting customers to actual businesses so we look at a lot of the challenges the businesses we're working with now um the challenges they're facing are really just related to the um the environment um we work with a lot of businesses that provide services and programs and restaurants sort of the main street businesses and their customers now um can't come back to them the you know at the same rate that they were going to them before covid just because of health and safety restrictions so through grassroots investment crowdfunding, businesses can access the capital they need directly from the customers and community. And what we see through this model is that by turning customers and community into investors, when the market, when things get health, um, healthier and safer, um, those people will actually be the ones then with a commitment to frequent that restaurant, to go to that business, to promote it as much as possible. So in a way, our model is aiming to help businesses have a path forward after this. Um, we also try to work with businesses to set, um, to set this up in a way that will not um, constrain the business if things change into the future. So for example, when you get a traditional loan from a bank, typically you set yourself up to pay a certain interest rate quarterly. We're working with a lot of biz businesses now to set up what we call shared revenue notes. And it's businesses promising um, their customers and community a percentage of their revenue until a certain ratio is met. So for example, we just worked with a culinary um, sort of a fun cooking school that has been unable to operate at full capacity. So they need more revenue to sustain their operation. They have promised their customers that they will get 1.5 times back their investment. Um, and they're paying a percentage of revenue over time. So if someone invests $100, they at most can get 150 back. And this type of model enables a business really to pay back on its own terms. If it's not making revenue, it will not be stressed to pay back. If revenue increases a little, um, they'll pay a little. So we really, you know, with our goal um, to build community wealth, we want to ensure that our model actually um, helps the businesses move forward, um, helps them, you know, build the capital they need. Oh, um, um, so if I had a spare $10,000, I would come and invest in this model or pick the business or would you pick the business? 
So we operate, it's called the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange, which is a virtual, it's a website and local businesses seeking capital are featured there. And then Baltimoreans, residents, people that want to invest can go there, um, click on the businesses that they like and invest in that business. But we actually, um, or focus on much smaller investments. I mean, if you have $10,000 and want to invest in a local business, that is is wonderful. But business or people can invest for as little as $100. And this is really meant to be a, a tool that businesses can use to really attract investments from, from their customers, the people that love them, um, rather than necessarily be accredited investors, which with much larger so amounts of capital. it's a crowdfunding model invest. almost, not quite, but similar yeah yeah i mean when people think of crowdfunding they typically think of kickstarter and gofundme these are models where it's more donation based people put money in um, and don't expect anything in return investment crowdfunding is different because when people invest they expect an interest rate uh, back a percentage of revenue um small piece of equity we work with each business to figure out the model that makes most sense for them um so, so it's a, it's a little different, but um, it's got it. Similar. Um, I just wanted to um, make uh, all of our audience aware that if you wanted to uh, begin sending in some questions to us, you can send it in in the chat, and then we will post it, and I will try to read them um, as as much as possible. Um, one of the questions that just came up, and I believe it's for you, Stephanie, is: um, Is this service free? Is there a fee that you're receiving, or your organization is? We are we are a nonprofit initiative. We work with businesses for free. We will, you know, our goal. For, first, I should emphasize this is a new tool. It's only been legal since 2016. So most businesses don't know they can access capital from regular people. Most people don't know they can invest as little as $100 into local business. So one of our core goals is just to educate. But if a business is interested, they come to us. We walk them through everything. Um, first, you know, make sure that this is a model that makes sense for them. And then if they are interested, we work with them through the whole process to ensure a successful campaign. Now, the actual investment has to be made on a federally licensed portal. We have partnerships with three of them, and they do take a percentage of each raise, which um, really funds the back end services. And they sort of deal with all the paperwork, all the legal ends of it, um, but they only get that once the once the raise officially happens got it all right so 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 everett you've, you've heard about different models you're more uh well not really traditional because you're a, uh, because of you're a, a cdfi but you provide funding to small businesses and other businesses um typically through an sba product is that is that correct <clears throat> Yeah, that's correct. And um, one of the products that we're very focused on right now is called Community Advantage Relief Loan. So it's a product that just came out in July uh, from SBA. It goes up to 250000 It requires a five or 10 year term. Um, and then it also requires 15 year, excuse me, 15 hours of, of continuing education or technical assistance um, with some of the classes being related to uh, uh, COVID. Um, what I call COVID pivoting. Um, and so we have those where we offer them one-on-one, -on -one, we offer them online. We have a, a local partner, Baltimore Community Lending or BCL that we're doing this in conjunction with. Um, and so that's one of the, the more common products that are out today. Naturally, we're also doing some advocacy work to adjust some of the rules that were involved in PPP to get an, another a round of PPP going for either those who were not able to participate in the first round um, and or those who were able um, who were able to participate, but might be looking for a second loan. Um, and then the third thing we're working on, of course, is trying to adjust some of the forgiveness rules uh, associated with the PPP uh, um, loan product. Yeah, but um, it just that actually reminded me. So some of these products are forgivable. I'm not. Yes. And and what, what does that mean um, in terms of the types of loans are out, that are out there and whether people are going to be able to have a forgivable loan or not. Yeah. So, and Paul, if you don't mind, I'm going to add something onto the back out there and answer this, yeah. but I'll first answer your question and say that 
there are several loan products out there where, and especially when the government is involved, where they're trying to get you to do something. And in the case of PPP, it was trying to get you to continue to keep your employees and your business afloat. Um, of course, there could have there were some things involved in the business that could have been considered. Um, all things aside, trying to rush the program through. I think Congress did a fairly good job in in kind of the beginning of the of trying to just get the money out the door. Now that we went through two iterations of it, we now know some of the tweaks and things that we need to make. Uh, but the answer to your question in this case was trying to get, keep those employees employed and trying to keep them paid and, and thereby stimulating the economy and keeping jobs as float as much as possible. And so in this particular case, if you were to do that, uh, to use the money for that and for a couple other things, which included utilities, uh, rent and debt that was that you incurred prior to February 15th as the business, then there's the opportunity for the loan to be 100 percent forgiven. We typically tell uh, our clients that about 80 percent of the money should be used on payroll. Uh, I know that the number is a little bit different, but the way the math is working out, 80 percent is about the right number. And then 20 percent on other things to make that uh, loan 100 percent forgiven. If you, I also want to just state that there are also grant programs out there. Several states receive money in several counties greater than 500,000 employees, excuse me, 500,000 in population, receive money as part of the CARES Act. And so I also think it's extremely important, especially when we think about the things that Adam and Dave said about um, dealing with your landlord and other things that you might be able to do. It's really important that the small business owner pay very, be very, very focused um, and what might be going on with their CARES Act money. For example, in Maryland right now, there's a debate over roughly about $500 million coming out of the rainy day fund. Um, and I think it's Senator Katie Fry Hester that's running it, as well as a couple of the legislators. Uh, and again, I'll post that in the comments so everybody has a link. But it, it's really important that the, the small businesses and the, the, the citizens of Maryland pay attention to that money and where that money goes. And I would encourage them to push, one, for there to be grants, Two, that some of this go towards landlords' rent abatement or rent payment, however, you know, whatever the, the professionals like Adam and Dave see fit. And then the small business owners like, um, excuse me, like Dominic and Steven, I think you all want to pay attention to how does it support pivoting, right? Because a lot of times what we have in the assembly and in, and in government is every, we're not on the ground, they're not on the ground floor. And so Lender is trying to add its advice and say what we think. But again, we're still coming from a perspective as a deployer of capital. Um, I think it's very important the receivers of capital get involved. In, and by all means, I'm not saying that anybody isn't. I'm just saying, make sure you raise your voice. Um, so again, I'll post that in the chat. Uh, but I think these are different things that we all want to pay attention to, especially as Congress is now debating a second round of funding for states and counties and different things like that as well. Yeah, I, I, that just reminded me that Baltimore actually has some CARES money available right now. Um, that are grants, um, and it's being um, managed through Baltimore Development Corporation's Baltimore Together website. So if you uh, get a chance, there's a website called baltimoretogether.com, and actually there tomorrow the applications for for grant funding is going to go live. So if uh, folk are listening in Baltimore, um, you may want to visit that site, baltimoretogether.com, to look at potential funding opportunities. For, for small businesses. Yeah, it's very important right now for people to pay attention to the lawmakers because this is, in fact, um, if we hadn't recognized the importance of lawmakers in our lives, this is the time when we really should pay attention to, to those lawmakers. Stephen, um, uh, I'm picking on you guys again because um, one of the complaints that I heard from a number of small businesses um, is that uh, when this thing happened, a lot of uh, well-meaning organizations, uh, the mayor's office and others, we all thought it was great and we just kept dumping information out there, dumping information out there. And um, we found that a lot of small businesses had challenges sorting through it. Tell us a little bit about how that occurred for you. Well, we had a boatload of information like other businesses. For us, we just um, categorized everything into files. And um, me and Dominic, we just pretty much both just partnered with going through the information. Um, he went through some government information. I went through some local government information. And we just pretty much 
were able just to break everything down um, from that perspective, just really splitting the information because it was an overwhelming amount of it. Um, and then we just, you know, tried to email everyone back and be responsive to make sure that we were getting the clarity that we um, were were reading, right. you know, making sure that we understood what, what we were reading because we yeah. were under a lot of str um, stress, like a lot of other businesses. And sometimes when you're under that stress, yeah. you may not be retaining the information properly. Um, so I think that's yeah. for us. We just took our time and went through uh, all of the emails. Um, Dominic, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. I, I remember you. Were, I was walking down the street with my camera one day down Howard Street and you stopped and, and we shared some information that day um, to make sure you got some information. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, information is vital, you know, to everyone, every business success, you know, and like Stephen said, you know, how you use the information, execute, you know, is very essential. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think we would just stay really organized, you know, and. I, helped us out a lot, you know, um, with making sure that we were on a good start. I think also follow up is yeah, important. Following up on the, to the different yeah. organizations. Absolutely. That really that really helped helped us out with following up with, with everyone. Yeah. Um so so David, I yeah. you know in your um in your negotiations and your sort of working with some of them, what are some of the the things that you thought businesses Either came prepared to deal with, or, or weren't weren't prepared, um, and may have may caused them some problems in the future. <clears throat> um, that's a good question. I think that the the first thing is, if you weren't the kind of tenant who was paying their bills regularly before the pandemic, um, and communicating with us before the pandemic. And then all of a sudden you need a bunch of help. Yeah. That's a much harder conversation than someone who has been on top of things. Even if you've had trouble paying your bills, most importantly, communicating with us and letting us know what's going on. Um, that's sort of the number one thing is communication. I think what happened with a lot of small businesses is they were just completely overwhelmed and they got caught in a deer in the headlights. And as we're reaching out to them saying, hey, listen, we're here to help. <clears throat> They couldn't even respond. They were so overwhelmed and scared and um, and uh, and nervous about the future of their businesses. Um, so that's that's sort of the first thing is that uh, you have to, you know, you have to return phone calls. You got to get on the phone. It doesn't matter how dire the situation is. Just tell people what's going on, and that transparency will help you significantly as you're showing this is what I need or this is what I want or this is what I need in order to to make it. Um, I think one of the important lessons, though, that we, you know, we got to take from this pandemic is, and, and this came up earlier, is it's not as simple as just deferring rent. If you've been out of, if you're a small business operating on a tight margin, like many small businesses do, um, good luck paying that deferred rent. That's never going to happen either. Um, it's sort of like a kick the can down the road mentality. Um, and I think a lot of us, you know, just did that just to, to sort of get a little breathing room and make sure the whole house wasn't going to burn down. <clears throat> but I think in the long run, again, it's about being open and saying, here, here are my numbers. This is what I'm making. Um, and this is how I can stay open as a business for you. And this is something um, that I, sh I shouldn't tell tenants, but I will. The reality is, is that oftentimes it's cheaper for your landlord to keep you. The reason that um, that landlords will work with you is not, and the reason I work with tenants is not out of pure altruism. It's also because it makes financial sense. Um, because the cost of replacing a tenant can often be much higher than the cost of making a deal with them to stay. But a landlord's not going to have that discussion with you unless you're being open and transparent about um, what, your, what your costs are, what your strategy is to stay in business, um, if you have a business that has no strategy that was losing money before the pandemic and hasn't pivoted to something that makes sense, you're going to have a really hard time negotiating with your landlord. But if you have a real business that makes sense and you can show, um, you know, what your opportunity is and what you're doing, as Everett mentioned, to, you know, what your leadership is doing, your landlord 
just from a pure financial perspective, is incentivized to work with you. In most cases, obviously, everything's um, you know there's specifics to every transaction, but that's that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, so transparency, be prepared for the conversation, have your financial statements together, and know what you need. Um, this is what I think I need to survive. And as you are going forward, if things change, which they most certainly will, because no one knew what was going to happen in March when all this happened. I don't think anybody believed we'd still be here in October with so much uncertainty. You got to keep an open line of communication and let everybody know this is the direction I see my business going in. These are the things I'm going to need help on. And these are sort of the, 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 the promises or understandings that we had that no longer make sense given the nature of the current situation. Excellent. Yeah. David, I just I was, I was actually, want to jump I'll in there to too. You, Adam, so you, you know, know. <laughs> <laughs> one one comment I just want to add before whatever question you have, Paul, is you know, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is essentially when you do have this um, sort of conversation between the landlord and tenant, it does um, sit outside of the greater context so much um, that it makes it hard for, you know, a tenant who has a failing business or has a difficult time pivoting or, you know, r relating to the current situation. And you have a, a landlord or property owner that has specific types of situations and obligations that they have. Um, you know, we, we've been trying to advocate as well that an entity like Baltimore Development Corporation, BDC, um, get into some uh, of these negotiations and try and potentially work um, with tenants. And, and when it goes, when it comes to renegotiating, insert themselves in such a way that could say, all right, property owner, you know, we know that if you're trying to look at the current financial status of this tenant, it's going to be hard to negotiate anything. Um, but if BDC would, would be willing to essentially take on some of that risk um, in terms of some type of ne negotiation, then that could help uh, to at least obtain some stability uh, in, in the meantime. Um, and I'm not sure what you would think about something like that, but it, it's certainly something that kind of intervention we, yeah, we think would that's, help that's, these types that's, of problems. Uh, interesting. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I, I think that it's important to, to look at all the resources, both state and city resources that might be available to be available to help you. Um, one of them that just popped up um, because uh, uh, Baltimore Business Lending is actually doing a, uh, a, a loan program um, that actually is, is coming through PNC Bank. And I'm glad that uh, Frank sent this to us. Um, there's uh, $300,000 in grants available for businesses affected by COVID. Um, and uh, these grants are going to be given out in, in $10,000 $10, increments. So, um, and that's t through, um, through uh, Jan uh, October 16th. So if folk have uh, opportunities, go to Baltimore Business Lending's site and, and, and you might see some opportunities for a grant uh, there. Um, hey, Paul, let, let me chime in on the, the idea about uh, just about, you know, people getting involved. I think that what a landlord wants to see, it's an interesting comment that you, that was made. The reality is what could be interesting is one of the things we asked our tenants when we wanted to know when they were seeking rent relief. And as I mentioned, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these requests is we wanted to know what are you doing? Have you applied for any of these loans? Mm -hmm. You know, have you reached out to your local government, um, you know, or local nonprofits? What are you doing in order to to show that, you know, we'll obviously as a landlord, we're going to, we, you know, to help you has a cost to us. It's not free because we have investors and lenders that we have to pay, um, as was mentioned. And I think that um, it, it's a, you know, even if you haven't been successful actually getting the money, I think it makes a lot of sense to tell that to your landlord. Look, look, I've applied for um, a loan with Baltimore Business Lending or an EIDL loan with uh, a CDFI or something from Lendistry, or I'm working with, you know, XYZ nonprofit to do these things because, you know, that will make people feel more comfortable about contributing to the cause of helping you stay alive. Um, it's not just us giving as a landlord, it's you saying these are the things I'm bringing to the table and we're working together. So I think that was a good point about, you know, uh, what what these uh, agencies and, and other folks can do to help to help 
to help lubricate the process. Yeah, I, I, I think it's critical. That's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that people knew about um, the Baltimore Together site, and also the state has a site um, uh, under their uh, under their Department of Commerce that can also let you know about different resources that might be available in the marketplace to assist you with growing and and and. Um, providing some assistance for your business. So these are all things that I think are going to be critically important. Baltimore Development Corporation has a Baltimore Together site, and the state of Maryland under their Department of Commerce also has resources available to you. And then there are other organizations like um, Baltimore Business Lending who are providing uh, grants uh, available to small businesses also. And, um, and that grant, by the way, came to Baltimore Business Lending through a program with PNC, and that's that's very important to know um, because you know some some banks are not always just lending money, but they've found ways to to provide grants to small business because we're all on the same sheet of paper. We want to make sure that businesses survive in the future. Um, we have about thirty five minutes left, and so I'm going to uh, continue to call for questions from our audience. If if you have any questions, please um, put that in survive in the future. Um, we have about 35 minutes left, and so I'm gonna uh, continue to call for questions from our audience. If if you have any questions, please um, put that in the chat so that we can make sure that we're answering your questions. Um, Stephen um, and, and Dominic, whichever of you want to do this, as you uh, look forward to your business, what do you see? What are, what are some of the things that you are going to, to do to continue to grow? Because one day, um, PPP may not be the core of your business any longer, and um, you're going to have to ex to make sure that you're you're maintaining your capacity to do other things. What kinds of things are you doing today to, as we look forward? Uh, Steve, so I will first. Um, we, different regard, we pretty much I would say like a couple of years ago, we've always planned to diversify our manufacturing. We start off with small manufacturing. We knew that. You know, just being a one trick pony, I would say, you know, it wasn't going to cut it in business, you know. So for us to diversify our manufacturing products, you know, was essential, you know. And then fast forward, you know, this COVID pandemic had occurred and, you know, now we're manufacturing PPE. So it was, it was exciting as it was, but this was like the, the pivotal moment that it allowed us our company and the leadership and see how our plans were able to come together, you know, um, just with the idea of what does this look like for our business to actually make more than just product in general, you know, just we're like by nature, I think we are um, like, that's the engineer in us, you know, we love to just make, you know, so um, that was very crucial. We do plan on continuing to manufacture, you know, not just PPE. I mean, I think it will be something that we will, always need you know we're already started working on making uh fashion apparel but ppe medical grade fabrics but making into fashion apparel um we've already started just with other contracts with other individuals you know working on a special projects so uh, manufacturing i think is just the way of the future you know for just as we know just for different regard and you know a lot more other startup companies are being getting more involved into manufacturing because they understand the the importance of it you know since this global pandemic excellent um so, so every you know that made me think about um businesses that are coming to you that may be pivoting to a new product and you look at their company right now as you're underwriting you see that they don't do that now what kinds of things will give you some confidence that you could underwrite them and actually go after uh, a loan product that might be yeah, great question i think the first thing that starts with is do they have a contract uh or have they won a contract so sometimes while they might not necessarily sell the product they might have the relationships with the manufacturers to either produce the product or they have the relationships with the end buyer, the vendor or something where they won the contract. Um, again, one of the things about the pandemic is that for if you take PPE, um, there were the, the, I don't want to say the standards loosen, but the standards were pretty available for a lot of different businesses to apply. And so you didn't have some 
the strict normal contracting standards in the school district and with governments, with the airports, with different things like that. And so that was really, really interesting for us to see some of the businesses come in where they want to contract already um, and they're trying to get financing, which kind of made our job a little bit easier because we knew where the money, how we were going to get paid back. Uh, so that would be one thing. The second thing I'd be able to I'd say is how far away is it for them to, you know, to really um, um, this new product. So I'll give you an example. We had a restaurant that had made, that already had a beer and wine license, and then they decided that they were going to now get in the business of delivering beer and wine through Uber Eats. So we knew how they were going to deliver. Uh, they already had the license, and they were already in a restaurant business. So what we're really talking about is them just being the go-between between their manufacturer, their distributor, their liquor distributor, and the customer. So sometimes it's, it's relatively easy for us. When it's brand new, um, completely out of the box, completely something different. That gets a little bit harder. And we start asking questions about past experience, collateral, or different things like that, um, which is not the normal things we ask for, but we'll dig into it a little bit deeper because now, obviously, our capital is more risk. Excellent. Um, one of the questions as you were talking, someone asked a question regarding business plans and where would they get them? So there are a couple of places that can help you write a business plan. For instance, the Small Business Resource Center, which has a number of resources to provide um, assistance with that. SCORE, which is the retired executives who provide um, mentorship as you begin to write your business plan. The um, Everett has um, on Lendistry's website, there are some classes that you can take there that help write a business plan. There's some, some other resources that are now around that can help um, answer some of the, the questions that people have regarding writing a business plan. Um, and it says here that live, oh, oh I see Dominic, you had something, you had a, something to chime in on, on live plans. Yes, uh, lot plans is something that we Goldman Sachs, um, the KSB program, and um, this is something that we use prior to the Goldman Sachs. Um, it's really it helps out a lot, you know. It walks you step by step, you know, um, with some, a lot of the questions that you may that you're going to be faced with. You have to answer during your business plan anyway. Um, answer some of the the questions that people have regarding writing a business plan. Um, and it says here that live. Oh, oh, I see, Dominic, you had something. You had a, something to chime in on on live plans. Yes, uh, live plans is something that we Goldman Sachs, um, the KSB program, and um, this is something that we use prior to the Goldman Sachs. Um, it's really it helps out a lot. You know, it walks you step by step. You know. Um, with some, a lot of the questions that you may that you're going to be faced with, you have to answer during your business plan anyway. Um, and it gives you a time, and it's locked, you know. So you, as long as the subscription base, you know, it's really maybe like twenty bucks a month, um, and you can just go and edit the um, your plan as you see fit. And you will have to change, you know, your plan quite often. You know, we've still used ours, you know, even though we wrote a plan last year, we had to make some modifications th this year, um, even with your for financial forecast and etc. Yeah. You know, it's 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 also great that some of the um, communities um, such as Pennsylvania Avenue are really starting to look at ways to provide assistance to the business, not only in their areas, but business that they're trying to attract to their areas. So, so they're also providing resources to small business. Also, I have a question here to uh, Stephanie. Um, uh, it says that we have a core group of 15 vendors that are looking for investors. Are you available to conduct a virtual technical workshop to introduce them to your organization and resources? A hundred percent. This is what I love to do. You know, for me, this is a tool that is really below the radar screen, um, and I am eager to educate businesses um, about it. How would they get in touch? Um, so with I you? welcome that opportunity. Um, they can go to our website, uh, communitywealthbuilders.org. There is a form that they can fill out with their contact information. Um, you can drop my email in the chat if people just want to send me an email. Um, I am usually usually available. This is in my heart, in my soul, and uh, eager great, to, to great. share I it think with, that with everyone. That's the best question for you all. So. Very good. Um, so, 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 so those are there's some there are lots of resources, Adam. Um, 
you also provide mentoring and one-on-one -on -one counseling for, for small businesses or you do it through classes? So we have several different pro bono legal service opportunities. Um, we do a lot of education, seminars, lectures, workshops. If there are specific uh, creative small business communities that would like to work with us, we create bespoke programming. We really see that small businesses generally, um, if they're interested in these types of educational vegetables, right, uh, in terms of legal, which is not always the most fun part of the business, then they usually have a sense of what they want to talk about, whether that's specific contract or business entity or IP type of stuff. So we'd love to speak individually with folks to create those classes. We also have monthly legal clinics, which now are all operating remotely, but you can go to our website, which is www.mdvla.org, and you can get a 30 minute consultation with an attorney once a month for free. Um, and generally there's no income cap, but if you have a creative business, that's an opportunity. And then we do have a, an income qualified pro bono attorney referral or in-house representation project. So on an issue by issue basis, if you are a creative small business that needs to get your LLC registered or your operating uh, agreement drafted or a particular contract reviewed, edited, negotiated, enforced, or register that IP or look over your commercial lease or have some other um, creative business related legal issue, we can actually pair you um, with an individual attorney like myself to take care of it. Um, so that's how we scaffold that particular programming. And again, the information about all of our programs is on our website, mdvla.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very important. Um, you know, that, that had made me think, um, we're doing a lot of work now online and there may be some uh, issues around copyright, issues around intellectual property that shows up with some of our work online. How do you help people with that? Sure, and that's a great question. Talking about uh, businesses that have been pivoting, one of the things that we've seen a lot over the past several months is folks and their businesses who are used to doing things in person um, and having to pivot online means new implications for intellectual property. So whether you run some type of business where beforehand, I mean, primarily if you're um, you know, a performance, you know, business where you have people, uh, you know, in person, um, and whether that means you're a teaching artist or the, you're some type of performer, going online means that you're automatically going to be um, bringing content that into a copied space, right? Every time you do anything online, you open a web page, you, you draft anything, you've created a copy of something. When you're in person, you don't have those types of things. So when it comes to um, creating new materials, Right. Let's say um, that you're a business that, in, you know, you were dealing with retail and you knew how to sort of deal with the copyrights and trademarks associated with your retail business. But now you're working far more online um, than making sure that your copyrights and trademarks are properly protected, uh, making sure that whatever licensing agreements that you have, if you are licensing copyright or trademark for your business, that taking it into a new context online, those same licenses are applicable. Um, to what you're doing online. And so those are things that you're going to have to go back uh, and check out. And, and again, if you're pivoting your business in such a way um, where the behavior is changing, your license might not only be not applicable, but you might think that you might want to start some different type of business entity. Um, so again, reviewing your contracts, looking at how your business entity operated for the business you were conducting in person versus online. These are all things that you're going to have to you know, have a little bit of a checkup on. And, and one thing that I just would love to mention is, you know, I'm an attorney, so I'm just one type of professional. Um, and everybody's pivoting that they have going on right now means that they need to be in touch with their accountants and in touch with their uh, bankers and in touch with their insurance folks, right? So every, and, and the acronym I like to give is bail, which every small business person needs your bail, right? Your banker, your accountant, your insurance person, and your lawyer. Um, and like we were talking about, Everett was saying, you know, if folks didn't have a great relationship with their accountant or their bookkeeper, it was going to make it more difficult to apply for PPP, right? To pull the documents that you need. Because again, if you have the right members of your team um, supporting you, then th th these things are far easier. Um, but the worst time that you want to realize that you don't have the right professionals that are a part of your business is when you have a crisis. Because if you have that relationship with a lawyer, it's easy to call me up and then say, hey, Adam, how do our contracts look? in terms of, you know, how can we get out of this contract? How we can how can we enforce this contract? How can we do things as opposed to crisis mode? And again, like many lawyers, I get most people calling me when they're in crisis mode, um, but we do get a lot of, you know, thoughtful, creative businesses who have been trying to 
um, do as much as they can with all of these types of issues. So I hope that's a uh, helpful. That's a great issue. answer. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's critical. Um, so um, many of your, sir. I don't know if if all of you are doing this, but um, many of the services that you have uh, are your service limited to Baltimore City, uh, Adam. No, we're a state-based organization. So if you're a Maryland-based uh, creative small business person, then you can reach out to our organization. Same question, Stephanie, your services, are they limited to Baltimore City? Same answer. I mean, our focus area is Baltimore City, but we work across the state of Maryland. And and ever I heard you mention Philadelphia and other places, your, your services are limited or are nationwide? Or national. So all our services are available. Uh, across the country. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, and 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 I know David, you have real estate all over the place, so you're you're mostly concentrated in this Baltimore area. I'm I'm actually interested to you just mention because one day you were a small business. Um, so what is it that helped you get to where you are now, where you're developing malls and huge tracts of land? Um, I, you know, I, it's to, you know, my overall belief is that how it works is you just, you, you work hard, you know, your craft, and then an opportunity shows up to sort of for you to go to the next level and you have to prepare yourself to seize that opportunity. And when the opportunity comes, first of all, you have to be able to recognize that it's an opportunity that's really that you can execute on. And then you really have to have the guts to go out and do it and take the risk. And so all of the entrepreneurs who have, you know, who started, you know, things on their kitchen table and and um, like my mother um, and, uh, you know, and ideas in a in a, you know, ideas hatched at a, at a friend's house on a couch or whatever. The idea is great, but it's the hard work that sets you up um, for the opportunity to take something to the next level. Um, and you can't get discouraged because you do have lots of ups and downs and and all kinds of difficult things that come to you like this crazy pandemic. Um, but you set yourself up for um, for the opportunity. And then when it comes, you've got to grab on and hold on to it with your legs and your feet and everything and, and until it uh, takes you to the next level. So so that 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 means and I, I guess that gets back to Adam. It's it's the business plan. It's making sure you have a relationship with your accountant. It's making sure you have a lender that you've been working with that know you. It is making sure that you have a, a, an advisor or a mentor that can provide assistance to you. So would you say that that was that's kind of what, what we're looking at here, Adam? I agree. I mean, I think what we're coming back to somewhat, because I do want to put a point on it, is um, you know, all, all small business folks, right, have that particular thing in them where they're a particular type of hustler, right? And they, you know, and, and they're smart and they're flexible and they have good ideas and they, they want to bring new things into the world. But but all of this has to do with support, right? At Maryland Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, we see we're just subsidizing a generally prohibitively expensive um, part of the uh, business process, right? All, all small businesses, all big businesses, you need corporate and business legal services. When I was in private practice, I was a cheap attorney at $250, $275 an hour, right? Um, that's generally prohibitively expensive for folks. Um, so what crises like what we're dealing in right now, this takes it to the hilt. During normal times, it's hard to be a small business person, especially you know one coming from a divested or marginalized community. But during the pandemic, it's tenfold. You know, we've been talking about some of the resources that are available in terms of support, whether that's, you know, grants or PPP or otherwise. Um, I mean, I just got to make sure that everybody understands the inadequacy of the resources that we've received from all institutions and whether it's philanthropy, government or otherwise has been so woefully inadequate. Um, and, and the carnage that this will have against all types of small businesses, it, it puts people, um, you know, like Lendistry, like property owners in very difficult position because at the end of the day, it's num you know, it's, it's dollars and cents. And, and even if you have really long terms to try and look at leases, to try and look at loans, um, if you don't have access to money and resources right now, um, you are really, really behind the eight ball. Um, and so again, thinking about how government, the fact that we haven't had another stimulus bill, 
it is a- absolutely insane. Um, and so because of this, um, we really need to have folks minding their P's and Q's, working with professionals like us, getting in touch with their landlords, getting in touch with um, uh, different types of financial services entities, but also understanding that they need to organize collectively, especially when it comes to working with electeds and other folks, because you know, you're, you're going to get a lot of unsavory answers from, from me and the banks and otherwise, um, because the traditional business environment has not changed and it's, and it's difficult. So small business, they've gone to all of the lenders. They've talked to all the organizations like the BDCs and, and all those guys and um, no help. Yeah. They are not getting any relief from their landlord. What do they do now? And anybody can answer this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. yeah. Well, I, and I will tell you that that does happen. Mm-hmm. And there are times when nobody will help you. And you know what you got to do? You got to put your big boy clothes on or big girl clothes on and get your butt in the office and figure out what you're going to do next. It's really hard. But I think what, um, I think what, I think that the the point that I don't want it to be that I don't want to be missed here is that small businesses are the backbone of this country. They are the most important thing we have going on in terms of um, economic development and providing jobs and advancing communities. Um, and you know, every small business owner should think of themselves, you know, as obviously a business owner. You're in it to make money, but also think of yourself as a warrior for the economy. Yeah. especially in disadvantaged communities, you you are doing, you know, you're doing God's work. You got to get out there because you're, you're employing people. You're putting people to work. You're advancing things. And without that um, sort of fire in your belly, um, you're not going to be able to get over that hump of nobody will help me. Because I guarantee you, we've all looked in the mirror and said, I have no idea how I'm going to get this done. Um, But if you get up the next day and you start making those phone calls and uh, we have a saying around MCB here where we say today's no is tomorrow's yes. So ask again and then ask, why couldn't you help me get that list of things and then don't just go home and cry. Write that list of things down and figure out how you're going to resolve those issues. And when you get to the last one, you can't resolve it. Call them again and say, look, I got three out of the four things done. I can't figure this out. How can you help me? Uh, Because people are much more inclined to help people who are working their butts off to figure out how to help themselves. Um, And so I think that's my advice is when you get knocked off the horse, get up and get back on and keep trying. So, Paul, this is exactly why I love grassroots investment crowdfunding, because you're not setting yourself up to be reliant on an institution. You know, if you are a business that has customers that believe in you, your community believes in you, why not reach out to them for capital? And it's really a win-win. You know, they will also build assets through this and the community will become stronger. And, you know, I've talked a lot through the business lens. Um, you know, on the community side, as Baltimoreans or as people that live in Maryland, you know, um, I always like to challenge people just to imagine the impact everyone um, that we could all have on the community if we take just a tiny portion of our savings and investment dollars from Wall Street and put it into Main Street. It's really a different model. It's really sort of reconceptualizing. If we want a sustainable, more resilient economy, you know, should we have to be reliant on outside institutions? Can we really nurture from the bottom up this resiliency? Excellent. So we've got a few minutes left. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Everyone, some of you, looks sounds like you've given your final statement, but I'm going to ask that everyone give your uh, final statement, but include your contact information. We've had quite a few people ask for contact information. So, Everett, why don't you give us started um, while we have you? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I got uh, I'm still still trying to uh, get my Internet stuff squared away after I got kicked out of a coffee shop in London. But um, the... Uh, you know, I think everything I was able to hear, even though you all weren't able to see me. And so I would just encourage all the small businesses to be extremely resilient. Remember why you started your business. Um, today's point, whether you are, you know, trying to help the economy and start jobs, whether you're a warrior, 
for small business or whether it's really basic, like you're trying to feed your family um, and and you're tr- just trying to make things happen for your own individual household. Just keep that top of the mind, whether that means you need to take a picture of your family, whether it needs you to take a picture of your I think he was about to say whether you take a picture of your cat or your dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, uh, Dominic, why don't you give us your final words for uh, for a different regard? And by the way, that is, I heard some people ask about what that name means, but a different regard. Sure, I'll answer your, your second question first. So different regard means to look different in French. Um, actually, it was, it, it, the French word was uh, regard different, to look different, but it flowed better off the tongue in English, you know, because we're an English speaking country. So we put different regard and it worked. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the advice that I would give to business is to look to diversify your business. You know, if you're doing business with um, business of consumer, look to ways to find uh, with your business plan uh, to do business to business, business to government. You know, um, you want that you want to diversify the way your income is coming in. That's going to help you out. Uh, pay attention to your industry. Know your industry. Um, and then work with other individuals that are in your industry that have more knowledge than you, and you can gain some of that through that knowledge as well, you know. So, um, that's what my advice that I would offer businesses, and because it helped us out tremendously, you know. And I will let Stephen, um, give all the contact information and any other thing. So, else um, that. different regards w.differentregard.com. Um, our showroom is 825 North Charles Street. Since COVID, we have been operating by appointment only. Our manufacturing space is 841 North Power Street. The contact number is 410-225-3777. It's best you reach us by email, shopdrdifferentregard.com. We have been doing pretty well with, um, with pretty much SEO. So if you Google the company, we'll come um, right up. I will say the biggest advice I would give is to really strengthen your network. Um, in the midst of COVID, it has been really impactful to the company and to myself as an individual that I had the network and that we are continuously to strengthen our network as we move forward with, with being business owners and also to seek education. Every made a valid point, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of educational tools out here that you can take advantage of. And I know as stressful as it is in the midst of COVID, education is power. So um I will say those are some of the things that I would say that um, is super essential in the midst of strengthening your business and continue continuously to move forward in the midst of COVID. Excellent. Um, Adam, any last words from you? Sure. Um, so not to end on, on the most uh, sour of notes here. I, I, one of the things that I see is I think um, making sure that you remember in, especially in these times that your business is a business. I think one of the things, especially since I deal with a lot of uh, creative business owners, their passion that's related to the goods or services that they're providing is so extreme um, that sometimes they can let that get into the ways of doing some of the things um, that I think uh, Stephen was just mentioning, right? In different regard, I think does a great job of letting their passion flow through them towards their business, but then also treating it as a business when necessary, right? And so uh, really letting the business part of the business, um, that business plan, which continually changes uh, what your actual revenue is, what your expenses are always guiding the way. Um, in terms of general advice, when you're getting overwhelmed, the thing I always tell myself when you have 10,000 things to do, just do the next thing. That's my mantra all the time. Do the next thing, you do one thing at a time and that list will eventually go down. Um, so keep hustling and, and again, reach out for help when you need it. I see a new T-shirt with "Do the Next Thing" on it. So, <laughs> so um, I, I I think everybody's um, put your information in the chat, and I appreciate this. I really appreciate uh, PNC and and uh, Baltimore Times for providing us with this time to chat. Um, a lot of uh, comments have come back and said that people really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope we can do it again. Um, Thank you all very much for participating today. I had a lot, a lot of good thoughts and ideas, and um, I hope we'll do this again soon. So thank you very much. Thank you all as an audience for participating with us. We really enjoyed uh, the information um, and the questions that you all had. So thank you so much. All right.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.